This video is an excerpt from my XE4 tutorial course about how to set up the shooting menu in the XE4. You can check out the link in the description for this video to look at the entire course, which will take you through setting up all of the menus on the camera, how to use the different exposure and focus modes, and then setting up custom functions. So let's get into the shooting menu. Now let's go into the shooting setting menu. If you enable the sports finder mode, it's going to crop into your photo, uh, cutting off the edges of the frame, but it's still going to show you those edges in the viewfinder or the LCD to give you awareness of what's happening outside the edges of your frame. So the actual raw photo and the JPEG photo will be downsized, but you can see what's happening around the edges to give you awareness of when something may be entering from the outside of the frame and let you anticipate that shot a little bit better. So you can see here, I put a white overlay around the outside edges. The black frame inside of that will show you how your final photo will be framed. The sports finder mode cannot be used with the electronic shutter. If you have the pre-shot electronic shutter enabled, it's going to start pre-recording frames when you have the shutter button pressed halfway. You know, there's that lag between our eyes to our brain to our finger when we want to press the button when we see something happening. So with this enabled, it'll actually start recording those photos as that shutter is pressed halfway. And then when you press the shutter all the way, it'll show you the earlier series of photos that were recorded when the shutter was pressed halfway. In order to use this, you have to be using the electronic shutter and you have to have continuous high CH selected for the drive mode. The self timer setting will allow you to set a timer. So when you press the shutter button, whatever kind of timer you have set, the shutter will trip at the end of that timer. Options are two seconds. So that's a very short, press the shutter button, two seconds later, it will take the picture. 10 seconds gives you time to get in front of the camera for a selfie if you want. And when you don't want to use the self timer, just turn it off. Save self timer setting will save whatever kind of timer you had set in the self timer menu when you turn the camera off. Unless you're using the self timer for every single picture that you make, I would recommend keeping this off because you don't want to forget that you had that 10 second timer. Something happens and you press the shutter button to make the photo and instead of capturing the photo now, you have to wait 10 seconds before that photo can be made. The self timer lamp will Blink that little light on the front of the camera to give you the countdown if you're in front of the camera. I usually just keep this off unless you're actually doing a selfie or a group photo and you want that kind of feedback. Under interval timer shooting, you will set up a time lapse photo sequence. We're not going to learn how to do that in this course because it's a little advanced, but some of the things that you can set up here is the interval, which is how long to wait between each photo the number of times, so how many photos to make during this time lapse sequence, and then the start waiting time, which is how long to wait after you press that shutter before the camera starts recording the time lapse. If you are recording a time lapse sequence, make sure you have an empty memory card and a fresh battery. Interval timer shooting exposure smoothing will attempt to smooth the differences in exposure from one photo to the next. Because the lighting can change and an automatic exposure that the camera calculates can also change, giving you a uh, choppy time lapse sequence, this will attempt to smooth that out. And it can't be used in full manual mode. You have to have some kind of automatic element like automatic aperture, automatic shutter, or automatic ISO. In AE bracket setting, we're going to set up our auto exposure bracket for when we do set our drive mode to AE bracket. And there's a few things that we can set here. Frames and step. Frames is how many photos do you want to make during that bracketing sequence. You can set from as little as two to up to nine. I just like to set plus or minus three. And then the step is how many stops of exposure between each frame. And again, you can set any number of uh, stops between uh, exposures here. I just like to set one stop of difference between each exposure that I make. And then under frame or continuous, you can tell the camera if you want to make 
one frame in that bracketing sequence when you press the shutter button or do the entire continuous sequence here. So I like to set continuous for this setting here so I don't have to press the shutter button to make each exposure. And then you can set which order the photos are created in. You can leave that as the default. My own personal preference, I just like to do the darker photos first and then transition into the brighter photos at the end. Under film simulation bracket, you can select which three film simulations you want to use when you have the drive mode set to film simulation bracket. The camera in this drive mode is going to take one picture and then process that one picture with the three different film simulations that you have set here. Focus bracket setting is an advanced feature that we're not going to get into too much here, uh, but this is where you can create your settings for creating a sequence of photos where the camera focuses at different distances. And this can be used to focus stack, which is an advanced post-processing technique. Uh, and you can set all of that up here. The multiple exposure control is going to set how multiple exposures are blended. When you are in the multiple exposure mode and you create a series of exposures, it's going to have to combine those exposures. Additive is going to add the brightness of each individual photo into a final brightness. So the three pictures that are pretty bright are going to end in one final combined exposure that's really bright. Average is going to average the brightness of all of the photos in the multiple exposure sequence. Bright is going to base the final brightness on the brightest pixel in the series of photos. And then dark is going to base the final brightness on the darkest pixel in all of those photos. Photometry is going to set how the camera measures the exposure, where in the frame it's measuring it. Multi-eye is probably the best option for most of us. It's a very advanced measuring method that's going to take into account a number of different variables to give us the final exposure. And I would just recommend, in the absence of any other information, just set multi. Center weighted is going to average out the uh, light in the entire frame, but it's going to assign higher priority to the center of the frame where it assumes your subject is. Spot is going to measure a very, very small pinpoint area of the frame. So this is like measuring the light with a laser. Wherever you point that little spot, that's where the camera is going to measure the light to determine the exposure. Average is just going to take a very simple average of the brightness of the entire frame to determine the final exposure. None of these options are available when you have the face and eye detection setting enabled because that's going to use its own photometry method. In shutter type, you're going to choose the type of shutter used to make the photos. The electronic shutter is extremely fast, up to 1 32 thousandths of a second and it is truly silent. However, it does have some limitations, and I've linked to an article in the text for this lesson where you can read all about the limitations of the electronic shutter. The mechanical shutter is just like the standard shutter type. It does have a slower shutter speed than the electronic shutter though, up to one four thousandths of a second. And then you can choose mechanical and electronic shutter. The camera is going to choose which shutter type to use based on the shooting conditions. Flicker reduction is designed to give you better photos when you're shooting under fluorescent lights. Because fluorescent lights are not constantly on and they actually blink, it could lead to some banding in your photos. If you ever are shooting under fluorescent lighting and you see dark bands across your photos, that's the flicker from the fluorescent lighting. If you see that, turn flicker reduction on. It does have some limitations, so I don't like to use this at all unless I actually do see that banding. Under IS mode, you're going to set the type of image stabilization. You can choose continuous, where the image stabilization is always on. Even if you're not pressing the shutter button, this will drain your battery faster. You can choose shooting only, where the image stabilization is going to activate as soon as you press the shutter button halfway to give you a sharper image for when you do press the shutter button. This will help you save the battery while using image stabilization, or you could turn it all off. If you're using a tripod, I would recommend keeping the image stabilization off because this actually can lead to um, a shake or a perceived shake, a blurry photo, 
when you are using image stabilization on a tripod. Under ISO, this is where you can set your auto ISO program. Fujifilm cameras give you three auto ISO programs, and in these auto ISO programs, you can program a minimum ISO, which is the default, the maximum ISO, which is the maximum sensitivity, and a minimum shutter speed. The camera will always try to give you a shutter speed faster than the minimum shutter speed, and it will always operate within the minimum and the maximum ISO range. If you choose auto for the minimum shutter speed, the camera is going to base the minimum shutter speed based on the focal length of your lens. In the notes for this video, I'll link to an article where you can read more about how to use auto ISO and Fujifilm cameras. It is a great tool to be able to use, so you can go ahead and read that if you want to learn more about it. On the final page, which I can't show here because I have the camera connected to an HDMI monitor, uh, but page three, you'll see wireless connection. And if you go there, it will start up the communication with the Cam Remote smartphone app where you can control your camera like a remote control and import images off of your camera to your smartphone. 